It's coming up to 10 minutes to the hour. You're, of course, tuned to Paris Live PM. Well, as the Islamic State armed group faces military defeat in the town of Mosul, its last stronghold in Iraq, Live on Live now turns its focus to jihadist threats in Africa. To a Western audience, what springs to mind are the big three, the Shabab in Somalia, Boko Haram in Nigeria and Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb. But jihad in Africa is nothing new. It may just look a little different to what your average consumer of Western news might think. Now, this is a view that's been put forward by today's Live on Live guest, Marc-Antoine Perus de Montclos, a senior researcher at the French Institute for Development here in Paris and an associate fellow with the Africa program at the Chatham House Think Tank in London. You're very welcome to the program. Thank you. Now, you've written books on the subject of African jihad, the most recent of which will be out later this year. It's called L'Afrique Nouvelle Frontière du Jihad, or Africa, the New Jihad Frontier, question uh, mark. You've also written a policy paper about uh, challenging the narratives of the war on terror in sub-Saharan Africa. So let's talk a little bit about those narratives. Uh, can you put jihad in Africa into perspective for us? I mean, the West is worried that... Uh, Boko Haram and uh, Al-Shabaab, groups across the, the Sahel and the Sahara will link up, become organised and uh, threaten to turn Africa into a, a deadly new front uh, in the, the, in, for global terror. Is this something we should all be afraid of? I think we should be vigilant. Now, I, I don't know if I'm going to lose readers if I give straight away an answer to the question mark in the title, but I wouldn't say that... Uh, Africa is a new frontier of jihad because jihad is a very long history in Africa from at least the uh, 17th century uh, up to now. And we tend to indeed have a global narrative insisting on connection with the Arab world. And we tend to dismiss the local dynamics in this jihad, which are very important. Whether you talk about the Shebab in Somalia or Boko Haram around Lake Chad or all the groups affiliated or linked to Hakim al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb that used to control northern uh, Mali in, 20, in 2012. So um, my answer depends on, on what aspect you're interested in. Uh, if you think jihad is new, my answer would be no. There's a long history of jihad in Africa. Now, is it a threat uh, to Europe, for instance? I think you have to put aside Algeria, which is a very specific case. But um, as far as we know, when we look at the Shebab in Somalia or Boko Haram or Hakim, they never perpetrate any uh, attack on, on uh, in Europe. Unlike Daesh, for instance, mm -hmm. which claim for some terrorist attacks, especially in France, this never happened. So these African jihadi groups are still focused on very local dynamics. So... We should be aware of this big narrative whereby it's becoming a global threat and there are connections. All these groups would be connected, whether affiliated to Al-Qaeda or to Daesh, and it would become the next major threat for the 21st century. I think we have to put that into perspective. So tell us a little bit about the, the history and uh, the effects of jihad uh, in Africa. I want to seize on what you just said there about uh, local dynamics. I mean, you've made the point uh, in the past that holy war has been around for centuries. Uh, you know, you've, you've used the expression uh, small jihad. And you've also said that it's helped to promote innovation and state building. Can you explain that? Yes, it's very interesting to see that um, when you did before colonization, when you didn't have states in the sense that we are talking about states today, uh, jihad was producing political entities like the Caliphate of Sokoto or the Masina Empire, uh, whether in Mali or in Nigeria. So indeed, jihad was through Sharia and the law of contract, a way to build polities and to organize societies uh, in a very hierarchical way. Um, these uh, polities were often based on the slave trade, no doubt about it, but it was a political organization. Because today we think GID groups as being non-state actors only and as being uh, destructive of the state. Uh, whereas they can also have uh, pretension, ambition to build another kind of state, which would be Islamic, based on the Sharia. And what is very strange is that very different groups claim to be jihadi. Uh, we insist in the European narratives or the American narratives only on terrorist group, but jihad is more than that. That is, 
The Caliphate of Sokoto, which in Nigeria belongs to the state apparatus, which was integrated by the British colonial master into the indirect rule system, uh, is also claiming to be the heirs of the jihad of Usman and Fadio in the 19th century. So the funny thing about it is that both non-state insurgent actors like Boko Haram claim to be jihadi, uh, state actors, part of the government, claim to be the heirs of a jihad, as with the caliphate of Sokoto, and the opposition, the parliamentary opposition, like the Nepu at independence in Algeria, also claim to be a real jihadi group, fighting against the corruption of the ruling class in Algeria, for instance. So you see, the word jihad can be used in many sense, whether by the government, sure. uh, including, of course, the Sudan, um, whether by parliamentary opposition or even by non-state so-called terrorist groups. So do you think that, that that's perhaps one reason why uh, Daesh, the Islamic State, their caliphate, didn't really make uh, inroads into Africa apart from uh, perhaps uh, Libya, Algeria? Is it because uh, they were less concerned with local issues and maybe more concerned with, uh, with ruling? Number one, I think there's a kind of... Um divine between the Arab world and the way they look at the blacks in the land of uh, the Sudan, which was a more global term referring to sub-Saharan Africa. And uh, so they don't invest as much as they would, say, in Europe, for instance. And number two, um, we thought at the beginning that it was a win-win game between, say, for instance, Boko Haram and Daesh. Daesh would claim to make inroad into the most populated country in Africa, Nigeria, the biggest economy, whereas Boko Haram would claim to have foreign allies. So uh, at the end, what we saw is that Boko Haram is now receding, uh, despite the allegiance to Daesh. And you will see many fragmentation that goes against the uh, idea of a global caliphate as claimed by Daesh. So at the end, it might be a lose-lose situation, actually, when we thought at the beginning that it could be a win-win situation. Uh, so just uh, talking more about misconceptions uh, of uh, jihadists and, and terror groups, um, the Muslim-Christian divide has played a role in conflicts in numerous countries. Uh, do you think that... Uh, it's, a, it's another misconception to assume that Christians are always the victims of, of targets carried out to, in the name of Islam. Yes, because you will see that these jihadi terrorist groups are mainly killing Muslims. They operate in the land of Islam where Muslims are a majority and they kill civilians. So, of course, obviously, that's mathematics in a way, most of the victims are Muslims. Uh, you have few Christians in the area where they do operate. So um, Christians can be targeted sometimes, not always. Um, and when they are even, uh, I mean, uh, the, most of the victims would be indeed uh, Muslims because these groups focus on a renewal of Islam and their focus is not so much Christian minorities to be converted by force. No, that's not the issue. The issue is to convert, to re-Islamize so-called bad Muslims. That's the real target. That explains also why these groups are really more focused on Muslims than Christians as such. Now, terrorist violence, uh, it often gets huge media coverage, which is something that increases the profile of the terrorist groups. Uh, in turn, this can contribute to public fear. Do you think the media is getting it wrong? <sighs> Ha. It's difficult to answer this question. There's really a challenge for the media. In one way, you're playing the game of the terrorist groups because you make them appear more important than they sometimes are. You know, you globalize the narratives of these terrorist threats. And yes, you, you play in the hands of uh, terrorist groups. At the same time, it's your job to report. And you have to report, but I think one should be very careful to separate the facts, fact-finding, uh, evidence-based research, from the narratives that want to connect all these jihadi groups with the Arab world, whether Libya yesterday with Gaddafi or even today with Saudi Arabia and the Wahhabi, I think we should be very careful about that. Uh, these groups copy each other. It doesn't mean they coordinate. It doesn't mean there is a central command under Daesh or Al-Qaeda. And again, it's very important, and that's the main message of this uh, forthcoming book, the local dynamics are more important than the reference to a global jihad. And just lastly and very briefly, in about 20 seconds, what is it that you're hoping to achieve with this book? Are you hoping to correct the view of governments? Well, that would be a great ambition, but yes, if possible. And I also intend to sell the book. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> Touche. Okay, unfortunately, we, uh, we're coming up to uh, the end of our program for today and we've run out of time. Uh, thanks very much. That was Marc-Antoine Perouse de Monclos, <laughs> a senior researcher at the French Institute uh, of Research and Development here in Paris. Thanks for being on the program. Thank you.